The following is a comprehensive timeline of the FTX collapse, an event that shook the crypto world to its core. There's a lot of videos out there explaining what happened or talking about the impact, but I haven't seen any great timeline videos, so I wanted to make one. In this video, I'll lay out all the events that happened in the exact order they happened to help you get a better picture of how this all played out. All right, let's set the stage. It's November 2022, and FTX is one of the highest flying companies in the world. It was founded just three Three years ago in 2019, but had already become the third largest crypto exchange by several different measures. They made over $1 billion in 2021 with just 300 employees. That was super impressive given that their competitors were like 20 times bigger, but only made a bit more in revenue. The VCs were of course impressed, and that's how FTX was able to raise at a $32 billion valuation at the start of the year. That was insane, and it made them one of the fastest growing companies in history. FTX was overflowing with cash, and they turned it into celebrity endorsements, sports partnerships, and they even bought the naming rights to the Miami Heat Arena. Now, what happened next was so crazy that you wouldn't believe me if I went back in time and told you what was about to go down. Okay, our story begins on November 2nd, 2022, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Coindesk releases an article breaking down the private balance sheet of Alameda Research. That's the hedge fund that Sam Bankman freed or SBF started, and even though he was no longer running it, it was still closely tied to his FTX exchange. The big takeaway from the article is that Alameda held a lot of FTX tokens, or FTT, and they took out loans with that as collateral. That did not inspire a lot of confidence in their financial health, because FTT was printed out of thin air by FTX, so it was risky for Alameda to be using that for loans. Now, people didn't really think much about the article when it first came out, but what it did was it successfully planted the seeds of doubt. Fast forward four days and it's now November 6th, 10.47 a.m. CZ from Binance announces his plan to sell all the FTT tokens that Binance was holding. This was huge because they were holding nine figures worth of FTT. So if they sold, it would drop the price significantly. That's why Caroline Ellison, the CEO of Alameda Research, jumped in a few minutes later and offers to buy all of Binance's FTT at $22 per token. She wanted to minimize the price impact of the sale so that their FTT collateralized loans wouldn't get margin called. Unfortunately for her, CZ rejected her offer. A few hours go by and it's now 4.49 p.m. CZ tweets again, this time explaining the reason for their FTT sale. He said that it's simple risk management, but he also compares it to Luna, another massive collapse which was still fresh on everyone's mind. So that creates a lot of FUD for Alameda, FTX, and their FTT token. Turns out CZ's tweet was the spark that lit the fire. Because for the next few hours, people start withdrawing more and more from FTX. That puts a lot of strain on their system. SBF comes out and says that they're continuing to process withdrawals even though the load was heavier than normal. Evening comes and people notice Alameda scrambling to send millions of stablecoins to FTX, trying to top up the reserves as people withdraw. That doesn't really calm things down though, and overnight, the panic intensifies. By the following morning, rumors were spreading about FTX's potential insolvency. It's now November 7th, 1.38, 8 p.m. and Sam finally tweets and tells everyone to chill out. He writes that they have full gap audits, they have over $1 billion in excess cash, and that they do not touch customer funds. He tries to spin this event as just some competitor trying to attack them. And honestly, his explanation sounded reasonable to me at that time. Later on, we find out that it was all a lie because everything was not fine and they did not have all their customer assets accounted for. That's why if you go looking for this tweet, you won't find it anymore because he deleted it. Anyways, it's nighttime now, 10.23 p.m and the price of FTT starts to crash. Alameda and FTX drew a line in the sand and were selling a bunch of their other tokens like Sol in order to keep FTT above $22. But around 10 p.m. they lose the battle and the price drops hard. By midnight it had crashed to almost 30% to $15 per token. Remember, this was super important for them because they took out loans using FTT as collateral. So if the price fell too much, they'd be underwater. This brings us to Tuesday, November 8th, and what happens next is probably the craziest thing I've ever seen in crypto. But before we get there, I wanna step back and discuss 
how we could potentially move past this crazy collapse that's left a black mark on our industry. Well, one way we can do so is by going back to the basics and remembering what makes crypto special. It's not the quick gains or the Ponzi-nomics. No, it's the privacy, security, and self-custody that we can't get anywhere else. And one great way to get those is with Railway. They are a self-custodial wallet that lets you do your crypto and DeFi activities in a private manner. And they're also the sponsor of our video. Usually when you do DeFi stuff, everyone can see what you do on Etherscan or Nansen. But that's not the case with Railway because they let you shield, send, receive, and swap any ERC-20 token in a private manner. They support Ethereum, BSC, and Polygon. And their approach is super unique because they give you both a private and a public address and you can move your tokens between them by shielding and unshielding them. But you know what's even better? You don't need to use ETH or their rail token because gas fees can be paid in the token you transact in. So for example, if you shield your DAI, you can pay the gas fees in DAI. That's super cool and soon you'll be able to do all that for NFTs too. So if you're curious and want to go try them out, just go check them out using my link below. All right, back to November 8th, and it's 11.03 a.m. SBF tweets that he's come to an agreement with CZ to sell FTX to Binance. When I saw that, I had to do a quadruple take just to make sure that I wasn't tripping. I was like, there's no way. Just a few days ago, you were having a Twitter war with CZ, and now you are capitulating and selling FTX to him? Well, we later find out that Sam was trying to raise emergency financing to the tune of billions of dollars, but he wasn't able to, and that's likely why he went with his last resort, aka Celta's enemy. But at that time, no one knew what was going on, not even his top shareholders. They were scratching their heads just as much as we were and they were trying to reach Sam to ask him what the heck was going on. Now, the whole time that was playing out, social media was going nuts. People were asking, how could this happen to what we thought was a safe and conservative exchange? And more importantly, where did all that money go? It seemed like everyone had a different theory as to what happened. But other people didn't care, and instead, they started to point fingers. They pointed fingers at regulators who cozied up to SBF during his trips to DC. Some even shared a clip of Sam talking to regulators and being quite the hypocrite. Compare that to what happens on FTX or other major cryptocurrency venues today. There is complete transparency about the full open interest. There is complete transparency about the positions that are held. There is a robust, robust, consistent risk framework. Crazy, right? But besides the theories and the finger pointing, there were also the memes. People joked that Tom Brady would have to play football until he's 50 because he lost all his money investing in FTX. Another meme was about FTX Arena becoming Binance Arena because of the sale. Now, this is just a small taste of all the buzz that I saw, but it's hard to describe how crazy crypto Twitter was because personally, I've never seen anything like that. Okay, back to the timeline and it's 10 p.m. that same night. SBF goes silent and quietly deletes his tweet where he wrote that everything was fine. That doesn't help him out though, because the next morning, things start to tighten around him. It's 11 a.m. November 9th, and we hear news that the SEC and the CFTC have both started to investigate FTX. And by 12 noon, we hear rumors that FTX's entire legal and compliance team has quit. By 1.50 p.m., several websites go offline, including FTX Ventures and Alameda's. And by mid-afternoon, hope starts to dwindle. It's 3.40 p.m. and Binance announces that they're pulling out of their non-binding deal. They say that the hole is too big for even them to fill, and also that they didn't want to touch it with all the regulators circling around. This announcement makes the crypto markets crash, with Bitcoin hitting two-year lows dropping down to the 15,000s. It's 7.47 p.m. now, and the DOJ joins the party of three-letter agencies investigating FTX. One hour later, the famed VC firm Sequoia shares a letter they wrote to their LPs explaining that they've marked down their FTX investment to zero. This made reality really sink in, because if Sequoia looked at the situation and thought that it was unsalvageable, than it most likely was. It's late at night now, 9.48 p.m. And finally, the FTX website updates and adds a banner telling people to stop depositing. Now, this next part was kind of crazy because at 10 p.m., Justin Sun from Tron swoops in and announces that he'll help make FTX traders whole. The way he wrote it was kind of confusing in terms of whether he was only helping Tron asset holders or everyone. But for a brief time, he looked like crypto's unlikely savior and that got him a ton of praise. Anyways, back to the main storyline. It's a new day, November 10th, 9.13 a.m. And Sam finally speaks. He apologizes for everything and then shares some key updates. He explains that Alameda is winding down and that FTX US is fine. 
He also tries to spin this whole ordeal as an honest mistake, but most people aren't buying it. Now, after Sam's tweet comes a flurry of events that will definitely surprise you. At 9.56 a.m., Tether announces that it's freezing some of FTX's USDT at the request of law enforcement. We also find out that Justin Sun is only offering a $13 million credit line, and it's only for the Tron-related assets on FTX. So he really wasn't the savior that he was painting himself to be. Fast forward a few hours, and it's afternoon now. 2.08 p.m. FTX announces that they are reopening withdrawals, but only for Bahamian residents and entities. They explain that the Bahamian regulations require them to do so because they are headquarters in the Bahamas after all. Now, just one hour later, people see on-chain activity that confirmed the withdrawals resuming. This special rule actually causes a ton of chaos because people saw this as an opportunity to cheat the system and get their funds out first. Some people openly offered FTX employees thousands of dollars to process their Bahamian identity so that they could withdraw. And around the same time, FTX US announces that they may close trading as well in a few days. Now that one was a shocker to me because SBF had just said that the US entity was safe. Now, as you can imagine, regulators were watching this whole circus and getting pretty upset at what they saw. Gary Gensler went on TV that day to blame the crypto industry for what happened. And outside the US, regulators from Japan, Australia, the EU, and the Bahamas all took various actions against FTX. Now that night passes and it's now November 11th and things are finally over. At 9.14 AM, FTX puts out an official press release saying that SBF has stepped down and that John J. Ray III has been appointed the new CEO. This is actually fascinating because John Ray is the same guy who cleaned up Enron after its spectacular collapse. Now, one hour later, SBF writes his own thread saying that he put FTX International, FTX US, and Alameda all under Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I was really shocked to see that the US entity was included as well. Like, what the hell? That was supposed to be protected under US regulations and now they're going bankrupt too? Well, a few hours later, it becomes official. And at 2.29 p.m., FTX US suspends withdrawals. Now, just when you think things are over, there's a huge curveball coming at you. Because around 11 p.m. that night, people notice funds moving out of FTX's wallets. The on-chain behavior is super suspicious, and people suspect that it's a hack or perhaps an inside job. There's also rumors spreading that the FTX mobile app is also compromised and is now malware. So everyone on Twitter is screaming to delete your app. Honestly, it felt like a total clown show at that point. But it's now the morning of November 12th and FTX officials confirmed the hack and say that they moved the rest to cold storage. People were saying that the Netflix documentary pretty much writes itself for the saga because things could not have played out in a more unexpected and crazy manner. Oh, and at 6.44 p.m. that day, Bahamas regulators released a statement saying that they never told FTX to open withdrawals for Bahamian entities. So it looks like that was yet another lie which was designed to benefit the inner circle of FTX executives. What a shame and so disgusting. Well, there you have it. That's the full timeline of the craziest collapse in crypto history. It was such a roller coaster ride to live through and watch as these things played out. Unfortunately for the crypto space, we're just now starting to feel the aftermath. But that's for another video. And I'm curious to hear what you think about everything that happened. And if you want more coverage of this FTX scandal, then subscribe to our newsletter, link below.